Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I'm Susan Lindner, your host of the Innovation Storyteller Show. And I'm psyched because today I'm not talking just with an innovator, but I'm talking with a fellow communicator. And sometimes I want to bring the firepower. I want to bring the double barrel shotgun approach to teaching you about telling better stories in innovation. And so there are amazing practitioners who do what I do in different fields. And I want to make sure that we bring other voices to the table about how to tell great stories, um, especially from the front lines of people who have done it themselves inside of large corporations, and also then sharing their expertise from an agency level perspective, from a entrepreneurial uh, perspective on how to tell great stories. And that's why I'm thrilled to have Bobby Carlton here with me today. She is the founder of Carlton PR and Marketing, Innovation Nights, and the organization that I belong to that she started called Innovation Women. Um, and she has been called Boston's Innovation Den Mother and the Startup Fairy Godmother. So if you're in Boston and need one of those, raise your hand. Bobby is going to tap you with her amazing communications magic wand. She is an award-winning marketing PR and social media professional. She speaks regularly on marketing and public speaking and women's issues. Her humorous approach and fiery let's make something happen brand is supported by the real world results she helps drive. 1,500 plus new products launched, $4 billion in funding achieved, 3 million monthly views, and 4,000 women speaking at conferences and events. I am one of those women, so I'm excited to have Bobby here. She's currently a parallel entrepreneur. Um, Bobby has spent the last 16 years building her own business as well as supporting client and community efforts previously. And in addition to working with a number of Boston area PR and marketing firms, she headed global PR at Cognos and at PTC, both publicly held enterprise software companies. And in 2006, she switched gears and joined a startup focused on supporting self-esteem and positive role models for preteen girls through a social network and book series, um, which I just think is fabulous. At some point, we have to get off the hamster wheel and pursue our passion areas in order to keep ourselves vibrant and alive and just doing amazing work. So in addition to heading up Carlton PR and Marketing, she also started Mass Innovation Nights, which is a social media-powered new product showcase and networking event. And MIN, and I love this, the folks who participate in MIN, Mass Innovation Nights are referred to as Minions, has launched more than 1,500 new products for free. These startups have received more than $4 billion in collective funding. And it's just an amazing thing. And lastly, Innovation Women which is an online visibility bureau helping drive visibility for entrepreneurial, technical, and innovative women through speaking engagements. And Bobby's goal, and I think we both share this one, is to eradicate mantles. If you don't know what those are, they're all male panels that you see at every tech and innovation conference that we go to, and to get 2,400 additional women on stage each month. And this is the number, hopefully, that will get us to gender equity on stage Currently, more than 70% of all conference speakers are men. So let that sink in. Um, Bobby has won a crap ton of awards. She has also led an amazing TEDx talk on Innovation Nights and Innovation Women. So please check that out. But I'm going to dive into the conversation. Bobby, thank you so much for joining me. Oh my gosh. Thank you for having me. Thank you for wading through that whole mess. Well, it was awesome. And it's not a mess. It's your beautiful life and we are grateful for it. So let me ask you this question first. How did you even get into this? We were talking about a kind of chocolate and peanut butter combination of communication and innovation like me. Where did this all start, start off from you? It's funny. I started off, I have a broadcasting degree. I worked in radio and originally you have that smooth voice <laughs> well originally i was going to be jessica savage and then i discovered i had a face for radio wow you're taking me back you're taking <laughs> me back but the younger uh, listeners she was a very famous newscaster she was stunningly beautiful and she also died tragically if i remember correctly yeah very young we lost her way too young yeah but for she was one of the early pioneers in broadcast journalism yeah, the Christina Applegate from the from the Will Ferrell movie. What was that called? Anchorman. Yes. Yeah. 
but very talented. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That is quite all right. I kind of popped that out of nowhere. But <laughs> then I discovered that the people on the other side of the table from me, the public relations people, often knew what it was I wanted to know. And so I wanted to be in the know. So mm. I decided to use my journalistic skills on the other side and become a public relations person. And one of the first agencies that I joined in the Boston area had technology clients. And I discovered that I had a comfort and affinity for technology and innovation, which were probably a little bit unusual for somebody at my stage and background because I did not come from technology. I certainly was not computer literate right off the bat. And uh, I got deeply into technology and just found that I loved it. Yeah. I think for those of us who are inherently geeks on the inside, we wind up finding our way. We start off trying to be cool like Jessica Savage, but our inner geek winds up taking over. Do you think that's fair? I think that's totally fair. <laughs> so you get to this place and you wind up joining um, Cognos, right? You wind up becoming the head of global PR, right? Global comms on that end. So what was that like thinking about at the time? Well, maybe you can walk us through some of the innovation that you were talking about at the time and really creating public relations structures and comm structures, both for external audiences, but internal too. Yeah. And I came from an agency background. So yeah. the the first couple of jobs I had in the world of technology PR were at agencies, which is kind of like dog years when mm -hmm. you are totally. looking at your background as driving experience in public relations. Yeah, you just get so much, expo you get exposed to so much stuff. Absolutely. You know, running yeah. around, kind of making clip books back in our younger years, right? Cutting out headlines and articles and making those for the client all the way up to advising a CEO, right? You're doing Absolutely. everything. Yeah. Yeah. You're standing at the photocopier with, with scissors and glue. Right. And... At one o'clock in the morning. Good times. Good times. <laughs> Good times. Uh, <laughs> stuffing envelopes and oh, sending sure. out press releases. Sure. Faxing. And one of my all-time favorites, knowing the zones for mailing press releases. Who gets it in a day? Who gets it in two days? And who gets it in three days? Oh, yeah. I At one point, I think I had every area code memorized. <laughs> at any given time, I could tell you where anybody was in the country. Absolutely. Then they started Definitely adding new ones. Yeah. <laughs> but when I left the agency world and I went in-house, I walked into a situation with a company that was right on the cusp of changing and really transforming. It had been an application development tools company for GL, for those of you in the geek world, fourth mm. generation language. And they were coming up with new products and new tools that they were designing using their own basic foundational tool. And they had a, a breadth of these new products that were coming out and the company was really transforming. It was really fascinating to watch going from kind of this old style to something new and exciting and the transition of the company itself to supporting this new raft of products. And the products had to be named. They had to be categorized and we were categorizing them as business intelligence tools in the early days of the business intelligence category. So it was the creation of a new desktop tool. Now, don't forget, before this, you generally wouldn't have business users using their own tools. They would be farming this out to someone else to do the analysis. So Either in the company or McKinsey or somebody, yeah. right, to get this yeah. done, or a specialized group that knew your target market super well. Exactly. So yeah. the change here was the ability to allow business managers and decision makers to do their own analysis 
and to figure out what the data could tell them. Mm. So reporting tools, analysis tools. One of our products was an online analytical processing tool. And we had a great campaign that came from the company where we were <laughs> allowing business managers to play with data that they kind of knew. So sports data. We had cubes of data that were available for major sporting events, and we were allowing people to use our product to analyze sporting data. And it really yes. helped, helped people mm -hmm. as they were figuring out, well, what can this product do for my business? Oh, I see. It will help me dive down into the data and extract details that I might have not ever been able to do. So when we get into the art of storytelling, right, the art and science of storytelling, what do you think you've taken away from all this time about what you share with leaders about how to tell a great story? Because an effective story, because there's so much buzz about storytelling in the news right now. McKinsey just came out with another book saying that storytelling is critical for any leader. What is your advice to leaders around telling the story around their innovation? Yeah. And I think this is key not only to establish companies like Cognos and PTC, but especially to startups. Yeah. I mean, every startup I think comes to the table with their aha moment. This is why I see that my product is needed in the marketplace. Mm. And the aha moment story can also be used for bigger companies when they're rolling out new products. We saw a need in the marketplace and the establishing of the product challenge and the problem, I think, are key to both rolling out a new product and to storytelling. What is the challenge that you are trying to surmount? Everybody needs a problem when they're coming to the table with a story. What is a story without conflict? Nothing. It's boring. Mm -hmm. So if you have a story with conflict, if you have a problem that is solved by your product, ta-da, like magic happens. I know. I always tell, especially entrepreneurs, they'll be like, I want to tell them the amazing story of how we had the idea, we built it, we got funded. And I'm like, I'm asleep. And <laughs> where there is friction, there is fire. I said, you cannot make a fire without creating friction first. And so if you want a story to take off, you have to find the friction that's actually interesting and empathetic with the listener. Where is their friction point? Where is their agony, their pain? That's the beginning of the friction. And even as a founder story, right? And especially in for internal audiences, it, people think that you kind of come up with an idea, you built it, it either worked or it didn't work. And that was it at large corporations. If internal innovators don't say, let me tell you, we had this idea. We had to go back to the bench 10 times. The chemistry team was really working on isolating X, Y, Z, and it didn't work. Like I need the 10,000 fails Edison story in order to make the light bulb valuable. Otherwise it just seems like this kind of glowy orb. And it wasn't that bright to begin with. If we don't tell the story of what it took to get here, then we don't have a lot of legs to stand on. And for our chief innovation officers out there, the average tenure of a chief innovation officer is 22 months, right? So we are actually need to be in the active process of storytelling constantly in order to get our ideas past the finish line and also to kind of keep our jobs so that we can continue innovating as long as people feel a part of the story. And yeah. I do think that over the 11 years that we ran monthly innovation nights events. Mm. We were running these events every single month and every single month we were launching between 10 and 15 new products. Wow. Innovation wow. nights was very focused on the product launch moment. Mm. 
I didn't want stuff that was an idea. I wanted people to come in and show their product. Not only because, hey, that's the moment where it's cool and it's real, but it's also often the point where companies, especially startups, I hate to say it, they tend to lose a little bit of momentum because there's a level of exhaustion. They're running out of resources. They know they've got this product that they have to bring to market. Mm-hmm. And they just often need that one little boost over the speed bump. And then they get a first customer, a first bit of coverage, maybe a partner who is key to them becoming viable. Like that was the moment of excitement for me. That was what I wanted to tap. That was what I wanted to bottle with innovation nights. Mm. However, sometimes we got companies coming in with a product in search of a problem to solve. That's cool. What does it do? They had a really good problem solution story. Often they weren't getting over that hump. They weren't exciting people. They just weren't making the connection. It's so true. And I think that's why design thinking exists, is to help people really get to the heart of the problem, not what you think it is. And Clay Christensen and other godfathers of innovation, right, have given us these roadmaps of thinking about jobs to be done, for example, or other frameworks where we can start thinking about what is the real problem I'm solving here and where the agony lies for clients. How do you help people get closer to that problem? I usually tell them it's being a professional nudge as I am. That's that's generally how I characterize being a PR person, poke, poke, like, but often it's asking a lot of questions. What is the problem we're solving here? Who is it that Mm -hmm. has the problem? Is it a big enough problem that they are willing to spend money on solving the problem? From there, sometimes it's digging a little bit more into the details. How did you come up with this idea? What is it that really was your light bulb moment or your aha moment? And those things merge and sometimes they don't. They go in different directions And you're like, all right, how did you end up coming up with a product like that? And it's not quite reaching its target audience. Let's think about how we can bridge that gap with a story. Showing people. I'm a big fan of customer stories and having somebody come to the table with, here's our product, and this is how an actual user is using it and how it solves their problem. That's a big key. I find that all companies, especially for entrepreneurial companies, but even large companies, they need the founder story. They need the value story. That's like what this thing does better than anyone else. They need the how I made it story. And they need great customer stories. And then there's the last one, which is this, Cameron Harold calls it the painted picture, but it's the vision of the future of how life will be if everyone who needed it had it. And if you can get those five stories into your arsenal, then you are hitting gold because there's not one story that sells an idea. People connect on all different levels. I always think of an innovation as this diamond and people are drawn to different kinds of qualities of that light. And so what is the facet that you'll begin to see your story that the, that the listener will see themselves in, in that light and decide, I want to take a step closer. So if you can develop those five stories, you're really ahead of the game when it comes to talking about your product or service. Absolutely. And early on with innovation women, like I saw the problem for both the event managers and the women who might not have seen speaking as a solution. I don't necessarily see innovation women as a solution. I see public speaking as a solution. Mm. The problems I'm solving 
yes, at a baseline level, it's two thirds of all conference speakers are men. And that leaves women out of all of these business and career opportunities. But the things that I'm really focused on are things like pay disparity, women earning only 80 cents on the dollar, the horrifying gap between male founded and women founded startups. I mean, women founded companies get less than 3% of all venture money, the lack of women in the boardroom, the lack of women in the C-suite. Like these are all things where public speaking could impact them positively. The yeah. more women we get on stage, the more women have the ability to be seen as candidates for board position get new jobs, get promoted, get more money, be more see, be seen as more valuable to their existing companies. Like I see public speaking itself as the solution. Yeah. So it's my job to convince women that they need to consider public speaking and the visibility that it derives. I don't necessarily call Innovation Women a speaker's bureau. I call it a visibility bureau. Where right. And it's designed to, to drive visibility. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Visibility for speakers like me, but also I think that women begin to gain an understanding of all these different places where they could be seen and didn't know about it beforehand. Yep. Yeah. And I don't really care if they are using... Instagram or LinkedIn or some other social network, or they're writing a book or whatever it is. Like they just need to be seen, be heard, to be better understood. I always tell people it's like, as a woman, the ability to get on a stage and tell your story, that's huge. That's right. monstrous. Every time you do that, it's a business opportunity. And it's a nice nod to the ancestors before us too, who were very obviously not allowed on stages, right? So being able to kind of change the trajectory of wisdom that was imparted to us, but not shared to the larger whole. And then the kinds of examples that we want to set for our daughters moving forward about taking stages and owning stages. I think it's so important. And I also think the way that we hear information, I'm so fascinated by how we receive information. Mm -hmm. I was a religion major in college. I was fascinated how the prophets move the word around the world and free Twitter. And, and it was typically a guy with 12 friends. If you're the Buddha, there were 40 friends, right? You went off to some obscure place. You got the teachings, you got the listening down, and then you took those stories, you made them your own as the listener, and then you shared them with the world. And as female leaders in our respective large organizations, how are we going about doing that? The one thing that I've found, if I look at the prophets as innovators to their own doctrine of the time, right? They were changing the norm of the pre-existing religious order that came before them. Um, they took these mechanisms of creating small groups of people who would become the spreaders. And they did that by making the story their own and then spreading it both from the, the voice of the prophet and also the voice of the recipient. And the more you're able to tell a story where the listener can make it their own and retell it, that's how innovation is spread. This is why I've come to find in the work that I've done in the studies is to find that innovation storytelling is different than all other kinds of storytelling because it requires the teller to create mechanisms that other people can share. So what are repeatable phrases? What are memorable words? What are verbs that connote action immediately that someone can say, if you come out of a meeting, hey, what happened in that meeting? I missed it. Tell me what you talked about. If the listener of your story can't convey that in a couple of sentences, you've lost them. And the research at Stanford has shown us that 
Within six minutes of leaving a meeting, if you've just shared statistics, it's been forgotten. Six minutes. So all the prep time you put in your Excel sheets and your PowerPoint presentations, if you don't create the momentum after the meeting, you've lost. So, you know, I'm curious, Bobby, when you think about helping women get on stages and the advice that we give to women, especially in innovation, what other things come to mind that allow us to stick out in technical fields? You're speaking at IEEE, probably the nerdiest gathering of all great nerdy gatherings. And I think it's the Institute for Electrical Engineering. Am I getting it right? Yep. Okay. I've spoken only once during COVID at a global platform, but it's IEEE is the bomb diggity of nerd diggity. <laughs> and yet here I am with my <laughs> broadcasting degree. <laughs> uh, right, right. Anthropology, broadcasting. And yet here we are. Exactly. It's funny, my background, a lot of the clients I've had over the years, pretty deep into the geeky world. Early on mm. in the late 80s, early 90s, I was working with FTP software on internet or inter, sorry, internetworking software. That's what it was called at the time. Wow. And like that was preceding the World Wide Web. I was one of the earliest PR people to have an actual email address. Wow. Like I was, that was exciting to me. I was able to- What like year was just, that, Bobby? I want to say 90, 89, wow. 90. Wow. And it wasn't CompuServe and it wasn't Prodigy. It was an actual email address. Yeah. So like, I love that. But like, let's go back to the question. Like some of the things that- I look at, for example, when I'm presenting and I'm telling stories, I have a presentation and it's called Terrible Tech Talks. <laughs> and it is a presentation about presenting technical information to technical audiences, because that is a lot of what our speakers do. And I do this whole presentation using sheep as my example. So every picture on my slides is sheep and people are like what are you doing but each picture is telling a story for example i have one picture where it's a whole bunch of sheep in a field and it's making the point that if you just show a whole bunch of random data points on a screen nobody's going to know what that story is and little arrows mm -hmm. appear pointing out the relevant sheep, the important sheep. Like there's little things like that we can do to draw an audience in, to make it fun, to make it humorous, to tell a story. To make it memorable. To make it memorable. And I have had people going, oh my God, I saw the sheep presentation. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that I haven't given that now in three years. And mm -hmm. yet you still remember it. Now, did you learn something from it? Oh, yes. Have. They absolutely have. When I give presentations on public speaking, one of the things that I've done is insert in refrains. For example, I tell people I have many jobs. I have many companies. You read off a big, long list earlier. Does anyone remember what those are? No, you don't. It's okay. But when I tell people I have a day job, a night job, and a dream job, they'll start to have a structure to put those bits of detail and data points into. So giving people a structure that they can put the parts of the story into, that's so helpful the refrains, yeah. the, the things that the audience can repeat back to me. I ask them a question. They answer it. I've had people in Boston, walk. I'm walking down the street. They're walking down the street. On the other side of the street, shout out to me. I said yes to public speaking. <laughs> Excellent. Because that's a refrain that I use in some of my presentations. 
Right. That kind of repetitive language is super helpful. What, what yeah. do you see people making giant mistakes? Like what are the big tech blunders that my audience is quietly wondering if they're making? Oh gosh, so many blunders, so little time. I will give you the feedback that I get from event managers. Okay. Event managers tell me that there are many speakers who have heard the storytelling message. They are cluing in to, I need to tell a story. However, they are telling boring stories. They are telling irrelevant stories. And they are telling stories without conflict or without any point. I have sat in and listened to speakers telling stories about their early lives. The minute a speaker says, I was four months old, I'm gone. Like, oh my God, what relevance does that have to what yeah. we're talking about today? Mm. If you've ever heard anything from Storyworthy, fantastic book. I'm trying to desperately to remember the name of the author. Mm -hmm. One of the things that he says is start your story as close as possible to the end of your story. In other words, strip out all of that extraneous stuff that makes no difference whatsoever to the ending and the conclusion of your story. And I'm like, ooh, that would help so many speakers. Stories don't mm. have to be in-depth, yards long, all kinds of extra detail and characters. What is the basic point that you're trying to make? Start there. Yeah. I often tell folks that when you're staring at a blank screen trying to come up with a story, especially one that's personal, it comes down to four key elements. People, places, objects, events. And the, the, the last piece is the theme. So if you're thinking about a story that you want to tell about the teamwork it took to build this incredible new product, right? That you're not a one man show or a one woman show and building this cool new thing, it's teamwork. So I go back to the people, places, objects, and events that conjure for me an idea of teamwork. And then I can go back to that moment in my life where I can go, wow, I remember that little league team. I remember that brownie troop. I remember that robotics team in high school. Or I remember the, ro the robot itself that got built as a res result of teamwork. I can go back to different places in my life by conjuring those four. And typically those are the things that create milestone memories in our subconscious even, and not just in ours, but in everyone else's. So the ability to very quickly key in to say, I remember being on the best team of my life. Everyone in the room can suddenly go, I know a team in my life. And now there's this phenomenal thing that happens with the human brain is when I con conjure a team and you have a team in mind, suddenly I'm locked in and listening. It's almost impossible for me to not listen. There's something very special that happens in the mutual filing cabinet systems of our brains that say we're both open in the same drawer, keep going. And that's where you get the lean in effect from someone who says, wow, more please. And it's fantastic to kind of watch that little experience happen as a storyteller Yeah, and, and figuring out what that is. Similarly, mm -hmm. the universal question if you're starting off a story with a question mm. that they all can take to heart, very similar way of going about it. Right. Have you ever, do you remember a time when mm -hmm. all of those are really helpful or I like even, especially for those of us in the innovation space is going, imagine if allowing people to project into the future now, not even something that's been here before, but imagine if. And then you create parallels and similes and metaphors that allow people to get to a future that they couldn't see before. So what do you think, the last piece I want to ask you about, Bobby, is this idea around pitching. I think so many of our innovation leaders are pitching every day. They are pitching a new idea. We know that six out of 10 great pilots or what have you are going to fail. 
telling the story about pitching an idea or going back in and pitching again after a colossal failure. What do you think is key to making a pitch really stand out when you're talking to big internal audiences like the CEO, the CFO, the head of engineering, head of sales and marketing? What is the, What makes a great pitch? Oh, I almost hesitate to say this because it sounds so cynical. I'm a big believer in the what's in it for me. Oh, yes. Thank <laughs> you. Yes. Selfish altruism, I like oh, to call. <laughs> what's in it for me? What mm-hmm. are you going to get out of this? Mm-hmm. Your listener meeting. What is the listener going to get out of this? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I do feel like every time we open up our mouths, whether it's to an internal audience, an external audience, uh, an audience that's sitting in front of us or an audience that is listening to something far away or recorded. I need to know that I am going to walk away with something that makes a difference in my life, in my business, and is going to be good for me. That's what I need to hear. Mm. And if it's solving a problem that I have that is top of mind, even better. But if it's the old, hey, this is how we're all going to get promoted. This is how we are going to increase our stock price. If this is how we're going to get funded. If this is how you're going to get a raise. I do believe that we are all selfish little animals and we are designed to self-preserve and to promote ourselves. Mm. Everybody has to win. When I started Innovation Nights, for example, I created these kind of principles of how it would work because I was asking people to utilize their personal networks, their personal social networks to help promote local startups. And I said, like, I want you to look around at these cool new products and I want you to get out your phone and take a picture to post something online, to tell somebody about it. You don't have a social network? Fine. Go find a neighbor and tell them post something on Flickr or whatever you do, help promote them. And you see the kind of glimmer in people's eye. What's in it for me? Why should I do this? Because when they're successful, we're all successful. They're going to hire people. They are going to bring in consultants They are going to make money and you're going to make money. Don't forget, I started Innovation Nights, the idea for it in 2000, when the market fell off a cliff and everybody was unemployed and companies were laying off people right and left. And I walked out there and said, all right, we're all going to work together. We're going to get these startups successful and they're going to hire people and they're going to need consultants and they're going to need co-working space and offices and lawyers and CPAs and marketing people. Hello, that's me. So I wanted everybody to work together for the common good. But really, it did come down to what's in it for me. Fascinating. I love using a tool called the empathy map to really get into the heads of the audience before you start writing your story. And really digging in and asking yourself two really important questions. What is the pain that my my audience member is going through, right? As I'm pitching them, what are they experiencing that I could help alleviate? And the gain that they're going to get out of, to your point, that I'm going to get out of this. So I really map it to that listener's pain and their perceived gain, which could be a raise, a promotion, a big financial windfall, whatever it may be. And then the last piece is, What is the pain my listener is going to experience even if they do say yes? What has to change? What systems need to be changed? What obnoxious new learning do I have to undergo? What expensive price tag do I have to pay to invest or to get access to this new thing? 
or people I'm going to inconvenience? What's going to be the agony of that? And then set up the potential objections as part of the pitch, addressing them so that when you get to the end, there's nothing left to say no to. I think that's really helpful in kind of paving a way to overcome the objections along the way. Yeah. Although I have to admit, Innovation Nights, I designed to make it easy for everybody. I'm like, it's no big deal. You're just going <laughs> to like, here's a QR code. You're just going to scan it. And it's going to create boop, an instant post. Easy. <laughs> they still had to get out and get to the events and meet the startups, but we were trying everything we could to make it easy for them. Yeah, that's true. And I think almost any venture capitalist would tell you, is it easy to use? Is it easy to get to? How can we get to simpler all the time? Yeah. Is it easy for them to understand oh, as that's... well? Mm -hmm. I hear so many startups trying to tell their story using every available buzzword and piece of jargon. Oh, uh. uh, no. Know why? Know why that doesn't work? Because nobody can repeat your story. That's right. That's what it comes down to. Word of mouth, baby. Word of mouth. <laughs> That's right, where it all began. Bobby, this has been such an incredible conversation. I want to ask you now the three questions I ask everyone who comes on the show. Number one, what is the greatest innovation of all time? Oh, the greatest innovation of all time. I mean, you have to start with the original innovations. Fire and <laughs> the wheel and things like that, because it's all based on that. Mm. Without that, we have nothing. Yeah. And what innovation team would you have liked to have joined over the course of human history if you could join any of them? Oh, wow. There's so many that just absolutely fascinate me, but I've got to go the whole rocket to the moon group. So set me down inside NASA and I would probably be a happy camper. Fantastic. And what is an innovation that you would love to see in the world that does not yet exist? Something that really pisses you off or something you would just love to have exist? Oh, man. I have to admit, there is so many different things that kind of piss me off on a daily basis. And I feel like a lot of them do have solutions. They're just out of reach for everybody. Yeah. And we can make decisions, the proper decisions, if we prioritize because the innovations are there. And if we prioritize things properly, it wouldn't be that these innovations are out of reach or not yet created. So, you know, I would probably go for something that will solve our challenges with the climate that would bring about world peace. Let's solve the big problems of the world. And unfortunately, I don't think there's one innovation that's going to solve any of those problems. Yeah, because they're all human-centric problems, right? <laughs> and yeah. the solutions probably do exist, but we are not willing to pay the cost. I'm going to leave it there with that philosophical ending of whether or not we will or won't be. Bobby, if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? Come to innovationwomen.com. I kind of live there these days. Yeah, fantastic. I love being there too. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Bobby. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.